Hi, and welcome to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast presented by Wolf Precision Incorporated, where we learn about and share long range shooting and custom rifle building. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. Hi, and welcome to episode 139 of Wolf Precision's Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. In this episode, we're going to be continuing on our fundamental series, and this leads into a question that we had sent in from a listener. It's going to be great information. A lot of it has to do with driving a rifle, and he had a couple good questions about it. I think it ties right in, so we're going to answer here on this podcast. We also want to talk about equipment and equipment matters, not on the rifle side, but on the gun building side. So we get a a lot of questions on, you know, when we build the ACE, how we build the ACE, why we build the ACE, and we are really excited that we're getting ready to grow and move into a 10,000-square-foot facility And we are getting ready to move into machines. And wow, what a whirlwind of just awesome going and seeing all of the incredible tools that we have available to make incredible pieces for our industry. But what shocks me is, you know, equipment matters. And so we we talk to customers all the time about, you know, with Bat Machine and some of the equipment that they use in the actions. And, you know, a lot of this stuff you can't see on the outside, all the fittings, the clearances and tolerances, the abilities of what they're able to hold, and the machines that are used to do it, and how the acceptable machines in our industry, you know, just to get everybody by, but it really leaves you vulnerable. So I've learned a lot, and I want to share with you just a little bit about equipment on the backside. I think it's interesting to talk a little bit about what makes a great shooting rifle and the tools that we use and should use to do it. So it ought to be a great podcast. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us here. Looking forward to it. Without further ado, here we go. All right, so we would like to say thanks to Trigger Tech. Trigger Tech is the maker of fine rifle triggers, and they make them for lots of different makes and models. We use them here in all of our custom rifles. If you purchased one of our custom rifles, we will send you a discount code for Trigger Tech where you can get a new trigger for your custom rifle at a discount, which is pretty awesome. Thank you, Trigger Tech, for doing that. Also, If you want to upgrade your rifle, one of the first things we say is, look, if you have factory or otherwise, you know, one of the really cool things about today is you can replace the trigger and really up your game a little bit with a very safe, reliable, and repeatable trigger with tons of different options. So if you want to upgrade your rifle, factory, or custom, stop over to TriggerTech.com. That's TriggerTech.com. We'd also like to thank Krieger Barrels. Krieger makes fine-cut rifled barrels. They are out of the great state of Wisconsin. They are American-made. They are family-owned, which is quite different from a lot of the other barrel manufacturers out there. And they really do make the best. You know, anytime we talk to a customer about a barrel and we say, well, you know, what do we use and, you know, what all the different options are? And we say, look, if you're going stainless steel or we stock Krieger, we've built on them for years. It's just that level of quality. So if you want to purchase a Krieger barrel for your custom rifle, you can stop over to a new program called Krieger Direct where you can order your barrel and have it in as little as two to three business days. And that is awesome. So if you need a barrel and you need it now, stop over to KriegerDirect.com. That's KriegerDirect.com today. So we were into our fundamental series and we were getting through parts and pieces, just trying to really share with you all the quick tips and tricks to get you the best out of your shooting. And in this one, we received a great question from a Daniel K. And Daniel had asked us two specific questions. He was talking and asking me to explain a little bit more about driving the rifle. And we've talked about this in a previous podcast. So if you want, go back, search the podcast and look for the podcast specifically talking about driving a rifle or learn to drive the rifle. And then he had asked also about the thoughts about pistol shooting and how does pistol shooting and those techniques apply into learning the art of precision shooting and I thought both were great questions and actually deserve some time so when we talk about driving the rifle his email had asked a very specific question but I'll I'll wrap it up in a nutshell that he's trying to tame the recoil trying to control the hop is specifically in his email he said that he uses a very loose grip jelly type grip and he was asking about what is the real concept? What are you trying to do? Why are you doing this? And so I've come to over the years, especially watching new shooters shoot on the firing line, to really understand that when you shoot a rifle, you have to sort of tell it what to do without overbearing it. And so there's this pendulum that swings back and forth from what I would consider the, the very 
loose grip, which would be like bench rest or PRS, where they're they're doing almost free recoil techniques to overbearing. Think panic mode with a three thirty eight Lapua with no muzzle brake, and you're getting ready to shoot it. You know how much you're going to clamp down on the rifle and everything in between, and they all have an impact on your shooting. And what I say about rifles and learning to drive the rifle is. I've come to over the years really believe that the steering wheel on any rifle is the buttstock. That is where you steer the rifle, but you also have to drive it. You know, you it when you shoot a rifle, here's what it's like. And maybe if you all have kids or if you're soon thinking about having some, let me tell you something. Um, raising children is like shooting. Y- you have to have a level of control without manipulation. You have to have boundaries and you can't hold on too tight, right? But you can't let them loose, right? So when you pull the trigger on a rifle, if you just do the loosey-goosey grip and, you know, you're really just loading a little bit of pressure on the buttstock, when that gun goes off, it does whatever it wants to do. And and sometimes, depending on where you're touching it and how you're touching it, um, it's almost like uh, giving free reign to a child at 15 years old and saying, hey, go do what you want to do. I mean, you, you're really asking for all kinds of trouble, Right. The same thing happens if you over control the rifle. So let's just say you bring that child and you say you clamp down on them like prison type mentality, right? You know, you're on Alcatraz, here's your box. So if you do that, then all of a sudden, you know, you've got other issues. So you're you're over controlling it. And then shooting a rifle would be almost like clamping down in fear. You know, you're really over gripping the rifle. Your face is getting really pushed into it. You're, you're, you're all clenched up, you know, ready for the recoil. That's what I would consider over controlling, but you have to drive the rifle in a very specific way. And you have to do it consistently to get just beautiful results. So you just can't let it go willy nilly where it wants and you can't manipulate it. If you try to force the shot to tell it where you want it to go, it doesn't listen, right? Just like a child, right? <laughs> so rifles are the same way. You can't manipulate them and force them into doing something. It still has a lot of energy and recoil and all these other things that it has to deal with when you pull the trigger. So what I like to tell folks when you're driving a rifle is this. You want to have very good, consistent, not your point of aim, that you're not forcing the crosshairs onto a target, right? You're not pushing or pulling. That's big. And then we go to our hand and we talk about a firm handshake grip. This is really important because we have to control the rifle. And what I found is that when people do a loose grip and they preach that they can shoot better if they do the loose grip that you see being adopted almost like free recoil style. And I agree. If you practice that technique enough and your gun's heavy enough, that removing yourself as much as possible from the rifle Some shooters do shoot better, but in real world scenarios for hunters, for match shooters that have to shoot in other positions where you actually have to grip the rifle, you have the burden of mastering two or three different grips on the rifle because you just can't loose grip it if you're shooting slung or if you're shooting off of a barricade that's uneven, you know, at that point you're gripping the rifle. So my rule of thumb is just learn one good solid handshake grip and go with it. And there's some tricks with your fingers and placements you know where we put each finger and where we're touching the stock there's lots of little things like that that play into it a little bit but i would rather master one grip and apply it to every position regardless and then try to learn and master two or three grips right then we go from there to loading the bipod or pulling the rifle into the shoulder either or and it's about two or three you know pounds of energy uh, or what i try to say tell students about two to three pounds that's all you want to be pushing or pulling so If you picture a seven-pound rifle, you're pushing about half the pressure of what the seven-pound rifle would move at. And then the last thing is cheek weld, cheek pressure. And then we go into our setup, right? Natural respiratory posture, clean, pull the trigger. But your left hand is usually back there, especially for shooting prone or from other positions, where if your left hand isn't touching the front of the stock, it's holding the rear as a support. That's the steering wheel part of it. That's where you learn to drive the rifle. People have a tendency to fall asleep what's in front of their eyes, and they forget that how they grip that rifle and the consistency of aiming it, that's where your aiming is done. And you have to hold that through the shot and let the rifle do what it naturally wants to do through your fingers or whatever bag it's setting on without you manipulating it and without you flinching, moving, releasing, relaxing, all of this while, while the shooting is going on. So, for example, 
there's so many things that go on at the rear of the rifle I could spend hours talking about. It. And if you want to see me talk hours about it, stop over to our online long range shooting school because the setup is huge. And we talk about a thousand different things that people do unknowing to them, you know, it's no fault of their own and not purposely making these mistakes, but they will manipulate the shot like crazy. And all of a sudden it just goes to hell in a handbag. A lot of it has to do with how they hold the rear bag and they start twisting it. So the rifle's not tracking straight or the bag's falling away. The toe or the heel digging into a bag or onto the ground, the way that you're gripping it and allowing it, how you twist your arm around to support, you know, that your left hand, if you're right handed, your left hand supporting your rear, how you do that, where you touch it, and then making sure that while the rifle is shooting, while the shooting process is going, that you don't ever grip or instantly relax. So it's funny that I would say once we're in the day two of the long range shooting school that we teach here, if we're watching shooters enough, and this is a learned thing, right? A lot of new instructors are very quick to start throwing out all kinds of just suggestions, right? So let's just say, for example, a student is shooting at 600 yards, and they were shooting well. You know, they were doing great, and all of a sudden it just goes to hell in a handbag, right? They're all over the place. And instantly, within a couple of shots of that, they start to get frustrated. So they're looking for guidance from an instructor, and the instructor is really quick to give them some pointers. Let's try this. Well, let's look at this. Let's do that. And if it doesn't work, the frustration continues and builds and grows to where you know, the student will begin to doubt that this guy even knows what he's talking about. What I have learned to do, and I'm sharing this with you, is don't say anything. Step back and watch. Let's just say a student looks at me like they really shanked a shot, and then they do it a second time. And they're going to look at me, and they're gonna be like, what do you think? And I'm like, go ahead and shoot again. Don't do anything. Just shoot again. And they look at you like you're half crazy, like, well, aren't you going to tell me something? Aren't, aren't we going to change something? Aren't we going to do something? And no, not a thing. And what they don't realize, I'm not even watching the target. Now, I've probably watched the first round or two, and I'm convinced it's not the wind at this point, right? They're sporadically going all over the place. I'm watching them. More importantly, I'm looking at their setup. And almost instantly, within the first even shot or two, I do a quick scan of the shooter and I'll catch it right there on the spot. And the shooters are dumbfounded. Like, they're like, you're kidding me. And I'll, I'll fix the correction, like turn the bag properly or get their hand. They're shooting again, perfectly fine. An hour later, I look, they're doing the same thing again. The bag's twisted. They're not holding it properly. They're relaxing as soon as the shot breaks. And all of a sudden they're having, and I'll fix it again. And I'll fix it again. And I'll fix it again. This is a super common thing at the school to just, because as shooters, our eyes are 90% of our input, Right. And so when we're looking at a target, that's controlling 90% of what's coming into us as far as shooting. And we lose touch. And we talked about this in the last podcast about all the feel of the rest of things that you have to control that you can't see. And so if you can't see it, you tend to not focus on it. You forget about it. It's If it's not in front of your face, it's easy to overlook and make common errors. So when I'm practicing myself, like if I'm out shooting and practicing and working on a rifle, I am really careful in the setup. If I think things are, are not looking right or if let's just say a shot goes crazy and it wasn't the whim, I don't change anything other than in my mind I'm running through my setup underneath me and I'm feeling the bag, I'm making sure it's straight, I'm, I'm checking all these things because more often than not, I got hyper-focused on something else. I was trying to time the wind, I was watching the wind, you know, do we shoot it in the now condition or predicted condition? Are we waiting for the conditions to come back or are we running out of time and we have to instantly judge what's going on? As soon as you get distracted, bang, you know, the shot goes. It's like we were talking the other day, it was really great, I got to spend some time with some incredible companies over the last couple of weeks and... We were talking about the one young apprentice, I guess, was saying about how he bought his first guitar and he's all excited. And the other guy was like, oh, that's awesome. I got a Gibson. And so it just turned out we all like music, right? And we all played. And the older gentleman was saying, you know, hey, I, have, I love to play, but I can't play and sing. And, you know, we had chimed in and said, you know, when you become a really great musician as far as a guitarist, you become a really great singer, right? But if you want to do both together, it's actually three times to work because you have to learn to play the song, you have to learn to sing the song, and you have to learn to do both at the same time perfectly. As soon as you're in the middle of a song, like let's just say you're playing in front of a thousand people, right? You know, people are having fun. They're looking at you. You know, you're looking at them. Everybody's doing their, this really cool stuff, right? As soon as your mind goes, oh, shit, what was that last lyric? Or, oh, shit, what's that next chord? Or where's my hand supposed to? As soon as you do, your focus shifts from singing or to playing – you messed the whole thing up. 
So it is, the, like the older gentleman had said, and I don't mean to throw you under the bus, Bill, if you're listening to this. If your focus shifts to one of those, you'll crash the whole thing. You, you, as soon as you start thinking about your singing, you're going to start messing up your playing. And so he was explaining to the youngster that was with us that to play and sing at the same time is just five times harder than learning to play or learning just to sing if you have that talent. And, and he was right. And shooting is the same way. You have to learn all these ballistics and winds and environmentals, right? Then you have to learn to be a great shooter. But now you have to learn to do them both together and with no vision. You can't see most of the things that either make a good shot or a bad shot. You can't look at everything. You know, you're looking at the target. It's like flying. Like I've got some hours in an airplane. I would love to learn to fly a bush plane someday, but you know, it's just not in the cards. Our business is growing and we're doing all kinds of really fun stuff. And it's what I like to do, right? So I'm not gonna sacrifice any time here. But Flying under the hood, they call it, where you're flying instruments only, where you lose your vision. Oh, man, is that something else. I've got a chance to do that a couple of times. And you're trusting instruments and you're not trusting feelings. You know, you, they'll get the plane going in a weird direction and your senses are all lying to you the whole time. You got to trust all the gauges and read everything. And, and same thing when you're shooting. You got to read all the instruments that you're working with. It's not always just feeling. And when we use our eyes as our primary shooting ability, our vision and our intent of just holding the crosshair still, there's so much more to it. So the other question that he had had was, you know, how would pistol shooting or pistol shooters cross over into long range shooting? And I thought this was a great one. And we talked about this here already with a customer this week that I find that those that come from an archery background or those that come from a pistol shooting background, think of like some type of competition involved in either, they take the long range shooting like ducks to water. All they need is the recipe because both of those, if you're good at either of those, there are fundamentals, there are rules, and they know how important each little part of the recipe really is. And they just need the formula. Honestly, I've watched so many times where we've had like competitive archers come through or competitive handgun shooters. Like Walt Sawyer is a great example. Walt's it's one of our instructors here. And he's a handgun instructor and shooter. He's a really good shot. My God, can he run a rifle? And it's just, I think in those sports, they really have to focus on fundamentals because it's so important to all of it, like hyper-focus, right? And so if they've mastered that, now they know how important fundamentals are. They need to know the rules of the game. And my God, can they take off? Like we had, um, he was a, a junior Olympic archery coach. He was one of the best, I think, in the country for what he does. Incredible guy, right? And I think he from West Virginia, Virginia. And um, I mean, he was just crazy good with a rifle. And he had some experience with it. He wasn't new, but he never really was, you know, fundamentally trained up. But it was like halfway through the class, it was just like, that's all he needed. He needed to know what the important things to look for. And it was done. He was just crushing everybody. And he wasn't like a 10 year professional shooter with rifles. He was a, an archery guy that just loved to shoot, never really got much into the long range stuff. And it was just like, holy cow. So over the years, yes, uh, to answer his question, those that migrate from pistol shooting or archery shooting and are good at it, you know, that are that are students of the craft, I would say, when they get involved into long range shooting, it's amazing to watch. Their learning curve is a lot less hard, I would say. They just need the fundamentals. So I do want to say thank you, Daniel, for sending both of those questions. They tied right in with our podcast, which was just incredible timing. I'm going to send you an email and just offer you a hat or t-shirt or something nice and cool for saying, you know, thank you for submitting the questions and for tuning into the podcast. We really appreciate it. So you'll be getting an email from me here shortly. Also, we'd like to thank our last sponsor. Uh, MDT is a proud sponsor of the show. We just got in our JAE700 or Jay Allen that MDT just reintroduced. We'll be doing a video review. We're filming that tomorrow. And they just make world-class chassis. So, you know, MDT makes everything from the new HNT26 right up to the ACC and then the ACC Elite, which is just really a solid chassis. We're building a lot on their product, and they come in here consistently over and over again at that level of quality. So if you want to upgrade your rifle, if it's factory or custom, another great way you can do it is honestly purchasing a good quality stock. And MDT's got a great selection for different makes and models right up from, you know, hunting straight through competition. And they make it for a lot of aftermarket components. So you think of all the different firearms manufacturers out there, MDT's probably got a chassis that would fit it. So you can stop over to MDTTAC.com. That's MDTTAC.com to learn more about that today.
So we had some questions on, and we always get questions on Bat Machine and some of the things that we do. And, you know, a lot of people, when they look at a custom rifle, they, they always look at it from the outside. Most of the shooters and people out there that get into this type of shooting, it's just like looking at the exterior of a car. You know, they all look the same. And so sometimes it's baffling, like when you try to explain to them, there's so much under the hood that's different. And the equipment and everything that's involved in making that is just mind-numbing sometimes. So I want to take some time here to talk about when you're getting ready to select components and when you're getting ready to build rifles and you're getting ready to... There is some stuff behind the scenes that if you really knew, you would just be absolutely stunned at the differences and what you will see in manufacturing. And it lends itself to our industry in the gunsmithing and gun building world, and it also lends itself into other industries. So the reason I want to talk about this is we talked about the bat machine action, the bat tactical, the bat igniter, the bat bumblebee, and you know Bruce and those guys at BAT. I just can't say enough good about the product, but they are world class machinist, but they use world class machines. So a good machinist can take a hand file and do some pretty amazing things, right? But you have to have the best tools, honestly. Now I'm not talking, you know, golden toilet seats here. I'm talking the machines that are capable of doing this. And so when you talk about bad actions, there's a lot of industry that does like um, you know, just best practices, right? Well, this is what everybody else is using, so this is what we use it. So this is the machine that everybody's using, so we're going to use it. It must be good enough for them. It's good enough for us. This is the lathe, that CNC lathe that everybody's using. Good enough for everybody else. The most accepted across the industry, we're going to use it, Right. I'm going to throw out a couple names here talking about this, but I don't mean any disrespect to any of the companies out there. And so I just want to throw that out there. That if you're listening to this and you like some of these these pieces of equipment, they all have their place in the ecosystem as far as what they make, what they're great at, and what they're capable of doing. But as you start diving into the world of super high precision, they are not the same. In skilled hands, can they do close to the same work? Sure, but they can't repeat that. There's just the skill set beyond – it's beyond the machine. It's the actual machinist now, and the machines aren't capable of doing it. And so when we're talking about the bad action, and I'm always amazed like when I get a chance to go out and visit those guys at Idaho, the machine shop is just absolutely incredible. It is full of the best, you know, like the Mazak Integrex, the, the, the Mazak MSY 200. I mean their machines in some areas with tooling is over a million dollars. These are aerospace type machines that are capable of doing things to the microns that is just absolutely incredible. And you have the machinists that are capable to get the best out of those machines. And they felt it's so important if you're trying to build the best to have the best tools to be able to completely do it over and over again that it matters. And so, for example, like a video tour of one of the most expensive manufactured quote-unquote custom rifles in the country so i don't want to throw out any names but think of like the most expensive hunting rifle you can buy maybe the biggest name in it right and they did a factory tour and they were full of hospital machines you know cncs and it's just like i get it but i often wonder when these companies are buying this stuff and they're they're sending it to their employees to do the jobs that they do is they all fall into the same category. They're close is close enough that that one thousandths is great and that one ten thousandths, or we call it tenths, are for Indians. I mean, that's, that's the typical saying in the machining world is tenths are for Indians, you know? So the, in no disrespect to Indians, that's just the saying, right? But the thing of it is, is they all fall victim to this. Like, and, you know, when we were looking for machines, so we're getting ready to move into a 10,000 square foot facility and we're looking at two new machines right now. And, you know, you can buy a Haas machine. I think retail is like 96,000, but I'm sure you can negotiate the daylights out of them and in the equivalent machine, probably get it for 60, 70. I know there's a couple other machines that are considered industry standards. Uh, Romy would be one that has a tail stock that a lot of manufacturers use. It retails for 90000 You probably have them for 70, 75, 80, 000. In the gunsmithing world, that's a lot of money, right? But in the manufacturing world, that's, that, that's just getting in the door. I mean, the level of consistency that these machines can hold, although they're good, 
they are not at the level that if you want a world-class rifle. So I'm stunned when you tout that you're doing the best and that you make the best, but then you're using basically tools from Harbor Freight to build it and finish it. And I hope this doesn't sound condescending, but unfortunately it's the truth. You know, you want to do the best, but then you always fall victim to purchasing the bare minimum that will get you by and get the job done, not the perfection. So let me flip this. And the reason I'm sharing this story, we got a chance to go look at a couple of the machines. We've been machine shopping for a month now. And it's it's probably going to be the lays we're looking at, you know, retail for $300,000 plus no tooling or anything, right? The the mills are probably with tooling and everything two to two hundred and fifty thousand. So well over with all the tooling and everything else, you know, having a retail value over half a million dollars, not fifty thousand dollars a piece or sixty, right? The reason we are hyper focused in on this equipment though, and the reason we are justifying buying it is because We don't just talk the talk. Like we have to have machines that are capable of holding to the tolerances that the rifles need to be built to, to shoot the way that we want them to. We are vulnerable to the tools of the trade. So for example, we went over to Westinghouse. I got a chance to see a facility that was absolutely incredible. Like they do here, it's here in Pennsylvania. And we got a tour because they took us in to see one of the machines that we were looking at. And the machine retails, I believe, is just over $300,000, and that's no tooling, no, nothing special, not set up, not ready to go. And so uh, the machine manufacturer said, hey, we've got one of these set up, and we went and seen several of them. But the Westinghouse, the backstory of this, they do a lot of the repairs to the stuff that comes out of nuclear power plants. So think of everything in there, and some of it inside the radiation containment area. So you're talking about pumps and motors and all these things that are running the water inside the actual reactor. And the world that they live in is not just super high accuracy, but also incredibly dangerous, right? If they make any mistakes or the the parts aren't exactly right. And so when I was talking to the two guys at the facility, they built a building just for this lathe. And they said, we didn't focus on price. We didn't focus on anything else. The only thing we focused on was quality. And what they were looking to do is there was some of these really, like think of a hand-sized part, right, that had to be held to such tight tolerances and such exact tolerances that most machine shops wouldn't touch it, didn't want it, and didn't want to do it and were afraid to do it. And because of these tolerances and clearances and because of the worry that if they do sub these parts out, that if they come in wrong, well, let's face it. I mean, this is, this isn't just shooting. These are, these are nuclear reactors and stuff, right? They just brought it in house. And this is the, the machine that they chose. And it was sort of amazing when you sit down and you think about the level that the machines are capable of. It wasn't about, you know, they could have bought 500 different brands of CNCs and probably produce that part pretty good, if not really good, and maybe 99% or 98% or 95% perfect in some cases, you know? None of that was acceptable. It just had to be right. And in order to make it right every single time, not not just a one-off either, it had to repeatedly keep making some of these different really critical components. These are the machines that they chose. And I'm often surprised that when we build custom rifles and we're asking people to spend thousands and thousands of dollars, that when we build the stuff behind closed doors, that we're using the the least expensive, the most entry-level machines that have a place in manufacturing. Don't get me wrong. None of these machines, if you're a machinist and you're listening to this podcast, I am not trying to offend anybody. Haas is a great machine, and so is Romy, and so is all of these other manufacturers. The reason they're still available and around for sale is they are good machines. But are they the best machine for what we do when we are when we get to that upper level and we're trying to hold these super high tolerances to build the best that there is? I don't think so. I don't think you're going to go to any aerospace industry where they're making things for like the Dragon rocket or the Tesla space rockets. You're probably not going to see these machines in there. People's lives are at risk. These things have to be perfect, and they have to depend on the machine to be able to do it perfect every single time. And why would we expect anything less if we're starting to charge premium prices? So to make the long story short, if if you're buying a bad action, you're not just buying the best, I think, in, in my mind. And the reason they're so expensive is because they're not making it on $80,000 machines. They're making it on machines, in one case, with all the tolling that's close to a million dollars. And so 
that quality comes at a price on the manufacturing side. And so they have to recoup that price. And yes, they could buy other machines and probably get just about as good. And they could probably copy and paste a million other actions that hold lesser tolerances that are good. Don't get me wrong, but they're not a bat. That's what makes them different. So when we were talking to the customer and saying, you know, what is the difference? And a lot of it is, is that not only do they have the know-how, but they have the best machines in the world to do it and to do it every time, all the time, every day. And that's, that's the important part. Same thing goes with the ACE and the barrels. Like, you know, we're very blessed that we have a five, six year run at this and we're getting ready to start bringing some of the manufacturing here. So we're going to start doing some of the barrel work here to, to alleviate some of the, the overload on that machine. And as we keep increasing in volume and sales, we want to be able to bring some of that manufacturing here so we don't overwhelm anything. We're really hoping that as we're growing that we have our foot in the door in a couple big industries that we could wind up with some really big quarters and we don't want to flounder. So we want to prepare way ahead of time and as we're growing to be ready. And that's sort of looking into the future. But the machines that we're looking at, you know, it's it's funny how the mindset goes. We have worked, I probably have 80 hours a week for five to six weeks straight of researching you know, driving hours to go meet and see these machines and talk specs. And, you know, thanks, Bruce, for spending all the time on the phone with me, too. But really weeding through asking the right questions because we want to build perfect parts and we want to do it all day long. And this equipment matters. And so, like, when you look at the Ace, when we make it, you know, we warranty this piece for life. And it's held to these crazy tolerances, which are holding plus or minus one to two tenths. And, the machines have to be capable of doing that. And not, there's very few machines that can do it over and over and over again. There's machines that can do it, you know, custom one off, custom two, you get lucky, you dial it in, you got a good run, and all of a sudden it falls out of spec again. The room warms up, somebody opens up a garage door, and the, the parts change a half a thousand. It's, it happens, right? And so having machines that not only can we build the part to that level, but build it over and over and over again to get the same results, that's the important part. And I think, you know, in the gun industry itself, that's the part behind the scenes that you don't see is like everybody's touting that they have the best, but then they're cheapskates on the back end buying the least expensive equipment and yet charging you the premium to do it. I don't get it. You know, as a manufacturer or someone that loves to build super high quality stuff – I don't get it. Like my South Bend Heavy 10 that I was my first lathe I ever purchased. I bought it from California in 1978. It was a real tool room lathe with no tooling. Now keep in mind, no tooling. I actually have the original receipt. It had 100 hours on it when I bought it. It was the gentleman I bought it from still lived at the address it was shipped to with his name on it. It was $18,900. That was in 1978. Eight, nearly going on 45 years ago homes back then could be bought for that price range right 1978 if you put that in today's money that's got to be close to a hundred thousand dollars and this is no cnc by the way this is a straight up tool room manual lathe and so you, you don't have the expense of the electronics you don't have so it is a six-figure manual lathe with no electronics whatsoever because it's designed to cut super accurate, super repeatable, flame-hardened ways, hand-honed. I mean, it's just absolutely an incredible piece. When we're going to have it in our new shop. We're going to get it in there. We'll get it all dressed up and, and really show you what an old-school two-room lathe costs. But, you know, it was super expensive. I could have gone out and bought any new grizzly lathe for six and seven and eight thousand dollars to start gunsmithing. I mean, I could have bought it brand new out of the box. People do it all the time. 18,000, no problem. But I bought a 35 year old handmade precision tool room lathe that even then was, was two and three times more expensive than a new one was. But that's what it had to be. If you're going to build and you're going to learn the art of machining and you're going to build perfect parts, you had to have the equipment capable of doing it. And so I just like to throw it out there that the question that we had had asked for the bat machines and that we get asked sometimes with the ace you know about you know we do charge a little bit extra for the aces it's a chamber cylinder made just there's more work in making that ace than there is in actually doing a completed barrel old school but it's reusable and it's it can be held to way better tolerances than drilling into the barrel but it's also made on equipment that costs in excess in some cases a half a million or a million dollars and so that's the level of part that you're getting and with that comes a little bit of increase in price too and so that's what we were trying to explain to the customer and, and when we were talking about the pricing of it and, and it always gets into you know well that's sort of a little pricier on the high side 
and it is, but you're actually getting something on there for it. You, the quality of the equipment that you're using has a lot to do with it, and it has to get incorporated into the price. And so it's not just a gouge, you know, so you're not selling and touting that you're the most expensive and best rifle in the world. And then in the back of the machine shop, you have just average or below average equipment in today's standards, but you're actually selling the best and manufacturing it with the best. And really, that's what we try to do. And so that's that goes into the cost of the equipment and it goes into the cost of, of the parts that we produce. But in the end, we can always hand the customer the rifle, the action, the work that we do and hold our heads up high that not only are you getting the best, but you're getting it made by the best and on the best machines in the world as well. So hopefully that answers that a little bit. And some of the common questions that we get when we get talking about bad actions and some of the work that we do here. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it here at the podcast. Also, don't forget to stop over and check out our online long-range shooting school. We are really moving along. We're just about finished with session one. We'll be doing and covering chronographing and starting to set up ballistics apps that'll be on saturday and don't forget we'll be doing our review on the jay allen that'll come out next week uh, that is a fantastic stock actually we've shot it for years before they went out of business so i'm really excited to get my hands on it get it in the field also if you enjoy the podcast please feel free to leave a nice comment and don't be afraid to share it if you know somebody that's in the long range shooting and you think they'd enjoy the podcast that really helps us out a lot too so from all of us here at wolf precision thank you so much for taking the time to join us i am jamie dotson and i'm your host and you're listening to the the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast.